Well, with the financialization of everything and the debt market collapsing, the, it took 40 years to get to that apex point of super low rates and that hypervaluation. You're not going to get a 40-year unwind. It's the classic story where everyone says escalator to the upside, elevator to the downside, and it's a snapped cable elevator. You know, you could, it could get uncomfortable in terms of the way you're going to be coming back down. And that's what I foresee. That is actually the collapse of the debt market is the turbo juice for gold and silver because that money has to flow somewhere. Okay. Well, much like you, you know, um, uh, you're German based and we're around the world based, but you know, a big part of our audience is US and you've got to show up for them. Uh, and some of them like to see you in the flesh. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that brings us here. And it's, it's hardly a, t a shocking place to come as well. Uh, it's, it's great, isn't it? It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really nice place. It's a bit humid for my taste, but yeah. uh, it could be worse. It yeah. could be way worse. So first of all, complaints here. Yeah, right? exactly. Absolutely. No, Francis, really appreciate you making the time. we got lots to talk about, obviously, and uh, you're, you're presenting here as well. Uh, what's the topic of your presentation? Well, uh, I'm actually attendee only today uh, in this conference. Oh. I came under the radar a little bit and I left Sorry, it a tad only, late. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Uh, I, I would have liked to have <laughs> presented. So broadly, I always look at things macro technically. Yeah. Uh, so I start there. I do, I love fundamentals. I'm deep in the fundamentals, you know, MBA, CMT, mm. whatever you want to say. Mm. Uh, and, and I listen to news and all of mm. that good stuff. But I, I'm a great believer that uh, the footprints in the sand as a tracker, and when you will understand the market sniper analogy and all of this, there's, there's, this is where I come from. You see things first in what people do and, the, and not what they say. Uh, and that's the footprints in the sand. And how do they express that? Well, big money moves markets, and you see it, therefore, in the charts. So we look at patterns, we look at volume, we look at interest, and we see various things. Uh, and that's how we go about it. An example of that would be gold's done exceptionally well, silver's done exceptionally well, miners are lagging. Some of the charts that I've looked at of those miners that are presented today, still not an increase in volume, still not got the patterns. It's something that's going to come, but I don't feel I have to jump in straight away. I, am, I don't want that first 5%. I want the meat, the burger patty of the move. You know, I don't need the bottom bun. I need that burger patty in the middle. Uh, and you don't want to leave it too late either. And I, and I have a feeling they're not ready. That would be an example of using a technical validation for how I'm still broadly more in the metals themselves, uh, gold and silver, than, rather than in the miners. But I do think at some point they come. So that's the thing you're watching for. Perfect. No, well, let's take a step back, though. Like, I really mm. want to talk about why we're even in the metals. Yeah. Right. And let's talk about the reasons for that. I think uh, you know we, we got lots to talk about there. Yes. Um, let, let's start with the economic situation. Let's start globally, maybe, and then, of course, since we're in the U.S. and yeah. it is the main market that moves the markets, we, we need to talk about U.S. economy health. Like uh, maybe we'll start there. How, how Love strong, it. How do you feel about it? And it's my favorite topic area. Um, so we are in a debt-based collapse. It is already happening. And this is the, the key slice that I think I bring a little bit of a unique insight, or there are the numbers of us, but many people think that, no, it's all about a pivot and gold will go up will, on a pivot. And I'm saying to everybody, we've turned, the debt market turned in 2020. There was a blow off event that coincided with the lockdown and that was a turning event. A 40 year bull market in the financialization of everything has ended. In other words, as an asset class for people to invest in, it's an absolute no-no for me. Yes, you may get rallies in a collapsing debt market. They're not to be touched because you could suddenly have the huge one and it takes everything away. So it's a bit like, oh, I want to swim upstream. Not a good idea. Swim downstream, go with the flow. So I am either short the TLT, for example, which is an ETF of long-term debt, or I'm square. I'm never going to long it, even if I think it may get a rally. And who's, who's the other side of that trade? Well, with the financialization of everything and the debt market collapsing, the it took 40 years to get to that apex point of super low rates and that hypervaluation. You're not going to get a 40-year unwind. It's the classic story where everyone says escalator to the upside, <laughs> elevator to the downside. And it's a snapped cable elevator. You know, you could, it could get uncomfortable in terms of the way you're going to be coming back down. And that's what I foresee. That is actually the collapse of the debt market is the turbo juice for gold and silver. 
because that money has to flow somewhere. So we're not nihilistic, everything down, world ends. When money moves, this still flows. It flows out of something into something else. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I'm personally, I might need a definition, maybe the audience as well. Like when you say debt market, like yeah. we need to break that down. Like what yeah. does that mean? Is that consumer debt? Is that uh, U.S. like government debt? Yeah. Uh, is it the bond market? So, yeah. Which is sort of intertwined in sure. on all of it. So I'm curious, just a bit of a clarity. Like what, yes. what, do, we, what do you mean by that? Yeah, and it's a very glad that you did that because it's only a lot later in my career that I started to focus and understand debt markets. And generally, we all start with equities. You know, we understand Coca-Cola, we drink a Coke and all of this. We have this very relatable uh, experience. But what many people must realize is that there's this whole uh, system that is assets creating. They call them assets and it's the borrowing mechanisms. Um, and if we look at this beautiful country that we're in and the beautiful wide roads and everything looks awesome, we also got to remember that they're creating a trillion in uh, new debt every hundred days. Many people quoting the statistic now. And where is it going and what does it mean? And how does it impact the fact that the sun still rises and Miami is still a cool place? It's very serious because basically the rest of the world uh, or up people buying the other end of that as an asset are allowing you to run an overdraft, basically. So you have consumer overdrafts. You ask, what kind of are we talking? They're all a problem, by the way. <laughs> so subprime cars, student loans, uh, consumer loans, credit cards. There's, there's a record high. There's over a trillion at 21.3 or whatever it is, uh, average pay rate on credit card debt. So you're seeing we're in a consumer and retail recession as far as I'm concerned. We met the criteria a long time ago. They changed the criteria. We're still in that recession, in my opinion, for the consumer. And that's why people are wondering about rate cuts. But the problem that comes with the rate cut is actually everyone feels, and this is such an important point, so I'm going to underline and put an interrogation mark here. Everyone thinks the central bankers set the rate. In the big normal environment, they do. But many forget that, for example, the British uh, changed uh, interest rates twice in one day during the crisis of George Soros shorting the pound. No. Uh, and that was not because they changed their mind after tea. They had a bad cucumber sandwich and thought, damn, let's rethink that one. That was because they were forced to. The markets will set your rates. So one, one term I've heard the last couple of days quite often is the bond vigilantes. Yes. Is that who you're talking about? There is an element of, uh, certainly of that. In other words, people say, I'm not buying any more of this. So when we refer back to that trillion every hundred days, people are, the, the, the government of America is expending that amount of additional money and they're not getting it in in tax. So basically it's an extension on credit card. And somebody is saying, I will buy that and own it as an asset because I will get paid that money back after the 10 or the 20 or the 30 years. And in the meantime, I'm gonna get a yield. And we've always had as a basis, so I did an MBA, most of us did, the cost of um, uh, capital is risk-free rate. I put that in, bra in inverted commas, is the 10-year treasury. Because if, if your business doesn't generate X return, you may as well just put in the treasury and pick up the yield. Uh, so that's the hurdle rate, because the minute you run a business, you're taking on risk. And the debt markets no longer deserve that risk-free rate monitor. In fact, they are going to they are actually going to devalue on you through many different ways. And you've already seen it. The long term, by driving the interest rates up as fast as they did during this last tightening cycle, you've actually had the 30-year lose 45% to 50% of its capital value. So that means as an investor, and there's all these city bankers, there's pension funds. So now you have to stop being a consumer and just understanding Coke and Toyota and everything you touch and realize that the government has created this product that other people were prepared to purchase because it was an investment and it provided income streams so that they could fund their pensions. They could meet uh, other requirements. They were receiving investment capital. You have the Californian Teachers Fund, for example. You have all of these things that are actually big and they need a park up money that they're being allocated to pay future liabilities. Now, if you have a capital devastation of 45-50%, what you actually have are pension fund managers that have just watched a cake shrink immensely. And they have to, off those, the income stream, make good their liabilities. And when they don't have sufficient income stream, they have to use some of that capital. Now, if that capital is just halved, 
because you're sitting with a portfolio of long-term debt, which is what the recent run in the debts from near zero to the current levels has done. So there's incredible leverage. People don't understand there's a great degree of capital implication when you move an interest rate from near zero to uh, five, five, six percent. So by being dominant, because this has led to the dollar, the currency being fairly dominant, um, relative, not to all currencies, but to most, uh, Dollar bragging about being dollar strong is the same as bragging about the fact that your debt has devalued more and faster than everyone else. Uh, and this is the problem. So you're seeing international central banks decide, well, we don't need to hold so much. We're not spending as much in dollars because we're doing you know, bilateral trade with Russia, if you're China and in, in yuan or, rim, or rubles. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, you're saying, um, I don't need to hold as much dollar de denominated assets. And they've just handed me a 45, 50% loss. So actually this is no longer looking such a good thing anyway. So they become net sellers. So the problem then comes when you're issuing ever more because you're spending more than you're living is who's going to be your new buyer if your old buyers are no longer buying and in fact they've become additional sellers. So there's not a bid anymore. And I mentioned the California Teachers Fund because they actually didn't sell. They needed, they couldn't meet requirements and they kind of said to government, hey guys, um, we, we need to sell some of this but there's no one bidding at the levels we need. They're way down there and we're not taking that wash. Uh, and so what then happened is that, oh, here's a bank who'll lend against your assets to give you the money you need to meet pension commitments. So what you've actually got is a pension fund that's adding leverage to meet commitments that its assets, its existing assets should already be doing. And it's not getting it out of the income of those assets. It's trying to sell the capital value of those assets, which means there'll be even less of it to generate income. So this is not a virtuous circle at all. This Sounds is like a pension. It's, it's 100%. <laughs> uh, and it's, a, it's the end of the... And actuaries... Uh, and I have a brother who's an actuary. I started out studying actuarial science. Actuaries have been warning about this cliff. When you add the demographic boom of boomers, net extractors, and the much smaller generations, everything is wrong about this. There is a reset. There's an orchestrated reset coming and we have begun the unraveling of the debt markets and that's why if we were to get a, a, a lack of bid in debt markets, the Fed will actually have to uh, have the market take over and they will force interest rates up because the values go down on rising interest rates. So if there's no one buying it and the only, the only conclusion you can come to is that the Fed will probably become toxic bank but instead of toxic bank in a commercial banking environment it's a nation state toxic bank that has to be the buyer of last resort of the own money that it's allowing its treasury department to create and keep borrowing so you're ending up um, the, the one who's spending is actually uh, circling it around the corner back to the fed and they're going to have to be the buyer like i'm always looking at okay when, when in, the, in case this happens let's, let's assume the fed comes into the debt market yeah. and starts buying it all because yeah. they said well we have to yeah. right and just add it to their balance sheet yeah. What, what is the end game? You, you, you mentioned the word reset, right? Yeah. And then I'm going to just like, I always go back to Japan. Like maybe yeah. I'm un mentally limited because it's always the same thing yeah. I come back to. Because I see it, they're sitting at 260% uh, debt to GDP ratio and they're the biggest holder of Japanese debt, for example. They just yeah. keep buying yeah. their own debt, right? Yeah. Is that something the US could do as well and just live on forever? And just maybe devalue the dollar? And like the US has the advantage or disadvantage at that point where they're the reserve currency, right? So is that... Is that, is that a scenario? It's like I think we've discussed that before. Yeah. It's like, and I keep coming back to it because I see like, because we're always talking doom and gloom. We're always looking for the, the reset, the big bang, like the yeah. crash. Like, but what if we just kick the can down the road? Maybe we sacrifice the U.S. dollar. Maybe the BRICS come out with a new currency in 24 months. Maybe it's partially gold-backed. Who knows? Um, and then the, the U.S. dollar goes the way of the Japanese yen. And it's completely irrelevant in world poly, like in world currency systems, and it's getting replaced by the unit or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Right. Um, is, is that something you see? Because then the whole crash scenario sort of just, you know, It's a very never good happened, question. And right? it's, and it's there, there are a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. So in Japan, the Bank of Japan and the Japanese people are the primary holders of their nation's debt. They do not rely on international buying. Can I jump in real quick? Because yeah. I've had a discussion with a friend the other day yeah. about who, who's going to call the U.S. debt. And then I sort of looked it up, like who actually owns the U.S. debt. And 80% roughly is domestically held. 
Really? Right. I'm surprised by that. So I, yeah. I looked it up. You like taught me something. Like, yeah. So I was like, I thought it was interesting. Okay, so that makes sense. Like, Japan owns, uh, sorry, um, Japan is actually the biggest debt holder. So I think $1.1 yeah. $1 trillion. Uh, China is like 770 something. I knew the billion. Fed had overtaken China, who used to be the biggest. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know that it was 80% because that's vast. So, but domestically, that also means like, dom um, Municipal bought like municipal debt and all. It's like the municipalities holding debt yeah. and things. So it's private institutions, but it's all like domestically based. Yeah. Right. It's not like just the U.S. Like one institution holds it. It's domestically based. But is the U.S. going to call it on themselves? Right. The, Even as the American people, are the American people going to call bankrupt the government? If so, that makes sense, right? Yes, it does. But remember, prices are marked to market. It's a bit like the gold price. A lot of the gold is not moving at all and hasn't, and it's only at the, the margin that the people are determining the price. If you yeah. have a lot, if you have that other 20%, let's go with your stats, and it's China, and Japan. And I hope they're correct, by the way. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it'll also be Belgium and Cayman Islands, these yeah. uh, slightly suspicious uh, entities that sound like proxies, maybe <laughs> uh, under some form of control. So it wouldn't shock me to find out that, um, you know, the Federal Reserve has bio of last resort proxies that are, de are internationalized uh, and could maybe be in that 80% or, or may still be part of the 20%. But there is certainly a point where everybody loses faith. And if you look just, if we change the, the, the t topic for a, uh, a slight shift to the side, if you look at the buying power of the dollar and you're seeing the hyper stagflation we're in, what you're actually getting is the consumer getting crushed. Um, you, he's battling. His, his tax take is going to reduce, so the income is getting more. You're getting into an almost parabola state of issuance. And then you're seeing it looks like buyer intent, not incompetence. Funds being driven to Ukraine, Israel for proxy wars and all forms of um, political uh, goals that are not financially astute. What that points to, to me, is that um, it's going to be a parabolic issuance. Because as you crush your consumers, your tax take goes down. And even if it's 100% uh, American, municipalities aren't going to be able to pay because they're not getting enough yield and the valuations are collapsing. So when you have wholesale bankruptcies at the municipal level, at the corporate level, at the pensions level, at the teacher's pension fund, the militaries, the war vets, all of these going bust, what's going to happen? You can't keep issuing more currency. And if you do, what ends up happening is uh, you have a currency devaluation. You did also bring up the Japan part. So while you yeah. grab your next question, then no, just like I actually got some stats. So I quickly went on ChatGPT yeah. and looked it up. Yeah. So uh, U.S. debt ownership percentages, foreign governments and investors, 33 percent, U.S. government entities, including the Fed and Social Security Trust, 28 percent, domestic investors, private investors, pension funds, insurance companies, mutual funds, 25 percent. State and local governments is seven, and then other holders is seven. Yeah. So it's sort of so are those is, institutions all American though that you mentioned? Because uh, we've got when, 33 when I'm, when I'm percent foreign. So 33 percent foreign, and 25 percent domestic investors, including pension funds, private investors, insurance okay, gotcha. companies. So so it sounds like, all U.S. based. Like I so, could do a bit more digging, yeah. but it's like there's a quick query here. Sounds but, like um, 67 percent, 33. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the 80 uh, sounded really high, but yeah, even the 67 is high. So your point is still good. Uh, we can quibble about the numbers. The, the, the interesting thing about how the whole currency and debt system is working and I'm going to try to give you a visualization for your audience to take uh, is you've got this geezer that's expanding that's going to burst and blow up you know hot water uh, <laughs> tank um, and you've got two taps to release pressure and one is the currency tap and one is the debt value tap and at the moment America is staying relatively strong in the currency compared to the other hot tanks that are also set to blow up uh, that are also dealing with the same problem. So we've got a leper colony where, you know, to enter the leper colony, you've had to kiss the chief leper. And we've all pursued policies of financial non-sound money. So you've got all of these ready-to-blow tanks and that people are managing releasing the pressure so that they don't blow on their watch. And the Japanese elected to preserve the value of their debt and are not allowing the interest rates to climb very high. Uh, any form of rate cut, particularly when you've gone at super low, is, is you get you know you go from 0.1 to 0.2. It's actually a doubling in rates. So you've got this uh, perversion that it doesn't sound like a lot, but it has quite a significant multiple of effect. They are they have only marginally allowing rates to go up. While if you compare it to the U.S., the U.S. did a substantial move in rates. What happened? U.S. debt collapsed more than Japanese debt. Japan's debt is being managed. It's called 
yield control. So everybody is manipulating to a degree, but which side are you manipulating? The Japanese currency has taken all the presser release. So they've largely let the debt tap kept closed. They've opened it very slightly and a bit of the pressure is creeping out, but they've opened the currency tap completely. And this has been our trade. We've talked about it for the last two, three years. You, everybody should almost have as a portfolio trade the yen short. Uh, and not just against the dollar, because there will be periods where we have dollar weakness. So we have, you know, we have the dollar and then we have another. And we have technical setups, even with the euro. And everybody hates the euro as a currency. It's so many different countries. And, you know, a German's different to a Brit, to Italian and all of that. But even against the, a flawed euro, the Japanese is going to use substantial value. We have targets well beyond 200 to the upside. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. No. So... And these are geometrically done and they're being like, picked off. It's like a straight line yes. going up, the Japanese yen versus the US dollar yeah. in particular. The only thing I'll say on that is given that I have access to gold, why do I want to trade a bad fiat against a really bad fiat? I just prefer the gold trade uh, because gold is going up against all of them. So you're... Oh, but before we go down the gold yeah, route... Okay, the, the stay gold with the fiat. Okay. No, let's, stay, let's stay on the Japanese yen because I find that quite yeah. interesting because that's how the US seems to be cross-financing it's, itself. Um, I see that. The yen carry trade, you, you mentioned it. Like... You borrow cheap money in, in Japan, like 0% yeah. or 0.1%, yes. and they're talking about another 100% rate hike, yeah. right? <laughs> Put to 0.2, I think yes. that's the discussion yes, yes, that's yes, very minor, yeah. But uh, the arbitrage is insane. So you borrow pretty much free money in Japan, yeah. and then you buy 5% yielding bonds over there. Yeah. Right? So you cross-finance the U.S., that situation. The last bond auction was three times oversubscribed. Yeah. Right? So, so you can't offset the balance. What, what happens when we reverse the yen, uh, the yen carry trade? When that happens, when the reversal happens? Oh, big problems. Um, the, the key aspect, though, as you've already mentioned, Japan is well on the way to 300%. doesn't have the luxury of um, world currency uh, anymore. Uh, anymore. It used to be very different and in that's the why, Yes, that's why I feel, and they've already flagged their intention. They're going to be minuscule in their unwind of their debt market. Uh, so it's, it's, it's almost... They've, they're trapped. They've literally, anybody who understands markets realize these guys are letting their currency go yeah. relative to everybody else. That remains the trade until you have first a dollar spike and then a subsequent collapse. So for now, the yen carry trade is a good place if you're, if you're investing them in your... Uh, the only problem with the, the treasury's investment is your capital gains is being killed because rates could spike higher. Yeah. So providing you weren't putting them into debt markets, which is why I say nobody should be going to debt. And I'm shocked by how many people will still say, oh, we're going to, you know, you should get into debt because that's the thing you do in recessions. Uh, the fear trade is dollar and debt. And I'm saying it normally is in normal cycles. This is end of cycle time. Everything gets inverted. You don't buy it. Just don't get in it. Keep it simple. You, you don't try to catch the rallies in a, something losing 60, 70, 80 percent yep. and that potential. And that's not the game to do. But if you took that d borrowed yen money and you were, you were say, purchasing uh, gold or a business or gold shares that actually generate an income yep. um, and we get the eventual uh, gold equity performance that we hope we uh, will get, those could be, that could be a very promising decade for you because you borrowed cheap. You're borrowing in a country that uh, currency is devaluing. You're going to pay them back in hyper devalued yen later. So you're going to get a currency advantage. You're going to get some income or some dividends, earnings, etc. That's a great trade. Just don't put it in the debt market because the capital value could go. And we could have a rate spike. Um, and this isn't spoken enough about. In the conference, a few people were saying, you know, it's all about the pivot and it's all about this. It's not actually. I disagree on that point. Uh, we'll, gold is working its way up both sides of the interest rates in, and if we actually get a super spike in rates that will be the most bullish because that will be a debt collapse and china has shown when they are distributing treasuries they are buying gold J just to clarify when you mean a spike in rates do you are you talking fed funds rate or are you talking us yes us rates what, what could what could trigger that because that has sort of been i wouldn't say a spike has been on the table but uh, an increase in fed rate high, uh, in fed rate fed funds rate was on the table so around april like i think it was a discussion it would be a big egg on the chin moment for the federal reserve because remember that what i described generally the central bank sets a rate until no. the market disagrees yeah. and, and that's that key point moment I, i'm basically predicting that there's a much higher risk of this event happening that the federal reserve faces their bank of england moment 
that was had in the 80s, the late 80s going into 90 with George Soros, where they came in too high to your country, the Deutsche Mark, on the euro. Thatcher was, you know, bullshit, a bit bullshit and said, no, we should be here to the DM. And, you know, Germany was making more stuff and selling more stuff than Britain. And there was a wrong peg level and they went into the EU mechanism too high. Uh, Sir Ross saw that and he just started loading up leverage and he was the bond vigilante at that point. What kind of yields or returns would you need to see like, for that to happen? Like, what, what would put the Fed under pressure when you, when you look at that? Well, what you get typically out of these events is that you get a capitulation. Yeah. They lose complete control. So the whole concept of central banking is they don't mind markets moving, they don't like disorderly markets. A fail event is when you get a disorderly market and what will actually happen is you'll have, like the Californian P Teachers Fund, the second biggest pension, saying, we need to meet our, we need to meet our aged, aged teachers in retirement's payments, and the Federal Reserve can't get a bank that is prepared to lend them money against those assets. Because the bank says, hold on, what are you going to do with me? I don't want that asset. I don't see it as fit collateral anymore. In short, the faith in the U.S. debt is no longer trusted, even domestically. It could start internationally, but it could become a domestic issue. And then the Fed has to say, well, we'll keep standing behind it and we'll keep printing money. And then you get that, meh, meh, well, you've kind of been doing that a lot recently. And that's, there's that tipping point. So everything is based on faith at fiat markets. And that's when everybody wants to go tangible. And the irony is the whole system and the economy at the moment is trying to drive us digital. Yeah. And it's the time where I say, government's your enemy. <laughs> what you don't hold, you don't own. <laughs> And that's what I love about gold. Yeah. And that brings us back to it. So, Francis, earlier in air quotes, you mentioned risk-free. Um, I think we need to drill down on that because I'm curious. Like, how much do you believe that the U.S. will completely collapse? And the debt you mentioned the debt market collapse as well. Like, will the U.S. not be able to pay back its 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 debt? Is that sort of what you mean by risk-free? Like, when you do the air quotes, it's like they will, when it collapses, it collapses, and you will be sitting on your losses. So, the risk-free reference was to how it's a legacy thinking of how government debt used to be characterized as an asset class. Yeah. So as a US 10-year treasury bill paying a certain interest rate, you would say, if you were entering a business, if it doesn't give me X above what the current 10-year treasury is delivering, um, it doesn't compensate me for the risk of my business. So I want to be a car dealer. There's, you know, car dealers go bust. The government never goes bust. You see, that's the that's risk exactly. free. So the challenge I'm now bringing is that it's a faith-based system. The scale and the mathematics is so large that we've passed the point of no return. And in actual fact, the faith will fail. And that we're already in part and parcel of the early stages of recognizing that, which is why people talking pivot are going to be disappointed. So many people coming into this year, for example, Kai, were saying we were going to have six, seven, uh, eight cuts. Now, we, as you would appreciate, we're in July, that's halfway through, and we've not had a single one. Um, and some people have now said, well, maybe there's one in the end of the year-ish. You've got an election, obviously, in November. They can't be seen to be doing anything that's overly political. People are feeling it. And what we're saying is pivot people are going to be disappointed. And the pivot's been around for a long, long time. Mm. And we've been saying, don't forget it, push it out, it ain't happening. And our primary motivation is they need to let the debt markets devalue. Remember my Giza, it's filling up, it's building in pressure, it's going to blow up. So they have to keep the two taps open and they've got to decide what allocation are they letting that pressure out, currency or debt market. And to let the pressure out means you're allowing deflation in valuation of the asset class that is debt. And the Japanese have gone, no, we can only do a tiny bit of that, but you can have the currency. And they've opened that tap full wide. And America has done the opposite, which is why the USD JPY is almost, as we say, a portfolio FX trade, uh, because the US have said, take the debt market. And we've swiped 50% off it. And they've done the tightest uh, of cycling, but the currencies remain relatively firm to most others. Uh, and we've actually had a degree of dollar dominance, not against the Swiss franc and the Singapore dollar. And in fact, the last three years, the peso's beaten the, the dollar. But that's because of politics. China's now got you know, sanctions against it or, or high tariffs, and now they're just assembling in Mexico. Yeah. So you've actually had the, Mexico become, the French shoring is just basically your 
Mexico has become your local China workshop. Um, so that's an anomaly that I don't expect will last forever. But uh, so the notion that dollar is all conquering is not quite correct, but it's certainly been in the more dominant currencies area. So th there's two extremes, and that's why I love that you brought Japan into it, because it's two different yeah. situations. But in actual fact, in outright percentage terms, you'll probably find the US is more indebted because they've got unfunded liabilities that are not baked in. The last time I heard, I think it was 17 or 18, Chicago pre Press has had that at about 600% of GDP. So welfare, Medicaid, all of these elements were a ridiculously high. So actual fact, the biggest indebted Ponzi scheme that relies on the international market also to support is going to lose the international market because they're going to see it and is then going to have to do it all domestically. And I think the central bank becomes the toxic bank. Um, but only now, it's no longer a, a, a banking crisis. It's now the top god, which is the controllers of the bank and the Fed becomes toxic bank. And do you, do you see any scenario where the U.S. would actually sacrifice the U.S. dollar? I think it's getting enforced. Likely? I think it's it like gets enforced on you. Uh, th that's the that's the great problem. Many people think um, no, they they won't. But eventually things take over. So what happens? What ends up happening is you'll initially get a, a dollar spike. If you get an interest rate spike you will have America leading in interest rates and that dominance becomes even more extreme. So then you'll have a surge in dollar and again, it will be a, it will be a very bad surge in dollar. Yes, your buying power will be going up, but what will also be happening is that people in homes will be uh, unable to meet mortgage payments. Uh, anybody with any form of variable rate exposure will be out. Job losses will occur. Then people have to sell their homes. New people will be offered terrible mortgage rates so they won't <laughs> buy it for the same rate. And that's where you get the hyper-financialized asset classes having to contract violently. And that's what the interest rate spike will do. So it's not going to be a, a, an awesome period of dollar strength and everybody going, you know, Americans going to Europe and, and buying up half of Paris. It's not that kind of fun uh, because of great. It's going to be a deeply uncomfortable one because people are it too leveraged. It's like a depression. Yes. Oh, oh absolutely. And the definition of depressions, uh, it's great that you bring it up. It's, it's two, uh, two years of negative growth. There's many definitions and they never talk about it because nobody wants to know. They're all, everybody knows two quarters in the recession but also with banking failure. So they're typically associated with banking uh, failure. And we have baked and built up the largest potential <laughs> depression. Um, and this is my great fear. The masses are going to absolutely suffer. And even if you've done everything right, you're gonna need to protect yourself from desperate masses. Um, that's why, and it's the perfect on-ramp for a new system, which I think they have been preparing, which is then takes you into the CBDCs, the UBI, and the global sort of surveillance finance communism. Yeah. Interesting point you mentioned with the CBDCs. I might want to touch on that in a second. We have some time left because the Republican sure. just, the party just announced their, uh, let's call it their playbook <laughs> for, for the coming election as well. And they're voting against their, against CBDCs, like while well, the Democrats apparently are full for it. Um, we'll, we'll get to that topic, but I want to just mention something else. It feels like the consumer's already getting squeezed. Um, the consumer Agreed. is not doing well, like all the stimulus checks have been used up. And uh, in, your, in your chair was Rich Checken earlier, like he's uh, the president of Asset Strategies International Bullion Dealer. He says some of his clients, because they also uh, buy uh, as a bullion dealer, they buy from, the, from their clients, they're buying gold, to pay for their credit card debt, right? So I, I see the consumer being squeezed because you can't refinance mortgages right now or you don't want to because you'd be stupid. Um, sometimes you might have to be, you'd be forced to because you you know, trade a 3% mortgage for an 8% mortgage. All of a sudden your $1,500 mortgage is $2,200, $2,500, probably maybe even more. So the consumer's already getting squeezed. Yeah. Is that something you're seeing as well? Like, and uh, how, how is that playing out? Like, is, is there even a reversal? Even a 25 basis point, pivot won't make a difference. I, I, I feel that this consumer is absolutely squeezed and I have a number of metrics. We have our own revenue as a business and I've seen it uh, get hit. Um, here, and I'll give you an example and there'll be, people can push back against some of these examples, but they're anecdotes. But I'm getting a lot of uh, small anecdotes. So we can see effects in our own revenue, uh, just checking out of Best Buy. 
guys saying, I don't think I'll have a job. Uh, they, they're doing a second, third, fourth round of culling. That's here in the States. Many people say, yeah, but Best Buy is being killed by Amazon. There always a couple of bucks more. I like to go in a store. I like to see what I buy and talk to an expert. You've got some amazing tech equipment. How useful is it to have someone who actually knows what he's talking about than just knowing everything and going to Amazon? Um, our developer of our platform has been liquidated. Um, we're having to move our stuff onto other servers, all sorts of things that are hurting. And they were dealing with small businesses, small, medium-sized businesses. So you're getting all forms of little anecdotes popping to me that people are in distress, uh, the retail consumer in distress. And you don't have to look beyond the inflation and the costs, uh, etc., of living, to, just going up. Uh, I mean, we trade the, the softs, uh, Arabica coffee and Robusta coffee just breaking to new highs. Um, this is a staple of everybody's drink. It's, as, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Kellogg's post toasties, you know, it's as, it's as straight in there as everything else. It's going up. Um, and these are commoditized things that should be disinflationary. You know, we used to run farms with lots of manpower. Now people are running 60,000, 120,000 hectare farms on like five people with massive capital equipment that costs a fortune to finance and the margins are tight. Farmers aren't making the, the, does money. Does that increase, pro increase productivity though? It does. It, so that's the disinflation. The, so they have the, become more productive. But there's no easy low-hanging fruit on productivity anymore. You know, it, it, it's, it's difficult to beat a combine harvester uh, yeah. uh, nowadays. You know, what else do you do? Yeah, I, I love these discussions though because it, it comes, you, you, you brought up UBI before, universal yeah. basic income, but uh, we, we were talking about how can you grow GDP? Yeah. You have to increase productivity. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's exactly what I'm sort of like thinking about because yeah. debt to GDP ratio over the last three years has actually been flat. Yeah. If you look at it, it's yeah. about 120 in the US, yeah. maybe 122, something like that, which, which has been mind boggling to be quite honest because we're running a $2 trillion deficit. Yeah. So, so GDP is increasing. Yes, we're, there's a lot of government spending, but you can't tell me that for every dollar the government spends, a dollar comes back in value. No. That doesn't work. Like, no. I don't see it happening. So there, we must be increasing productivity. And in fact, that's gone else. the other way completely. It used to be the good. They, like, they are on a terrible multiple now. Yeah. Uh, like the all government. the government jobs that are being created. Yeah. You can't yeah. tell me that they're, they're adding to the GDP because no. I don't think they're being counted anyway. So no. I'm not a statistician, statistician. That's not my department, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, so like the, the transgender workplace friendly consultant. Uh, how much is he adding to the revenue of that uh, company as an so, as example? In yeah, case. our government <laughs> employees, they don't add to the GDP. No. You cannot add them to it. So, But even the, the big corporates are adding these kind of jobs now. Yeah. Because it's become, we're we're getting this um, cultural Marxism uh, effect that is creeping in. The Roman Big Empire, have to do the Roman yeah. Empire, yeah, like that's we're right. The, right. But um, increasing productivity, I keep coming back to AI and all that. It's like, yeah. but it must be coming from somewhere. And, yeah. and that, I'm, I'm grasping at straws here, but we're, I'm looking for the savior. Yeah. Right, like something needs to increase GDP dramatically so we can sustain the high debt levels. Well, people talk technology is meant to be the savior, and if you listen to say Raoul Powell and all of these guys, you know you're going to have the exponential boom, um, but not before you first dispose of the old system, and you have to put the people in such a desperate situation that they'll accept anything. Huh. This is the problem, reaction, solution cycle that you tend to have to go when you're the governing classes. And unfortunately, my whole focus is we've got to, there's a flood coming and we've got to focus on getting the bridge over it. I don't want to look beyond that and say, well, it's, everything is awesome after that because then, you know, AI is running everything and all of this and we all yeah. sitting in deck chairs gaming. We, I was going to say, that, that'd be my dream scenario, but I don't see that happening. <laughs> no. Like, it's a very grim picture in my head no. when I'm, I'm quite pragmatic because when no. I think too far ahead and AI does everything, yeah. no. we're overpopulated. <laughs> yeah, no, then uh, and that's a very grim picture and we don't need to talk about that. Yeah. But let's talk hard assets. We need to talk about like, okay, where can you find safe haven? Like, where do you really should, or where should you really put your money? And that's where I will say physically controlling and owning your own uh, precious metals has got to be. I mean, I, I'd love to say there's many other things. I do think you should own other things physically too. So, you know, uh, Red outside mine. of precious <laughs> metals. Um, I mean, having having um, productive land is, is, is good, but I don't think you're immediately going to appreciate. You could actually go down, but you're going to survive. Uh, that's the important thing, and you're going to have capability of barter, and you're going to be probably non-urban if you have that, so you're going to be away from the social hordes that are likely to be caught by surprise by what's coming. So there's a lot of, that's a whole like prepper type topic class, which I won't necessarily take you down unless you ask me to. Um, but other... That's a part other, two to Yes, yeah. Physical <laughs> 
assets generally are good. But what people need to realize, property and homes that have interest rates associated with them, you're going to have a whole bunch of forced sellers and you're probably going to have BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street as the bottom of the cycle super hedge fund accumulators that are going to turn people into tenants in their own home. And they're going to buy cheap and they're going to let you bleed before they do it. So there's going to be the problem, the reaction, and they're going to let you hang in that miserable reaction for a while so that they get the deal of a lifetime to get you out of this thing you can't pay for anymore. So exposure to, to interest rates, people have to, have to understand. The exposure to interest rate spikes is going to be deadly. And that's at a point where the Fed loses its reputation and they lose control and the markets take over. And that's what you're referring to, the bond vigilantes yeah. uh, thing. And I think the faith has been tested in the parabola of debt creation and deficit building. And I think that moment is uh, the key point. And it's difficult to look beyond that. So the whole thing of deck chairs and AI, good mm. luck with that. You've got to survive the flood that's going to wash away the old system. And that means high ground and physical assets, gold, silver, coins, uh, bars, um, protection, um, safe places, and self-reliance. I also think utilities as government provide. So what happens when governments get indebted and they're losing and their central bank is, people are questioning this, the validity of the central bank and the system and you've got municipal funds failing and non-delivery of services and all of this happens. They go tax, they go full communist. So anybody who owns anything, you'll be punished for being um, high net worth, medium net worth, or mass affluent individual, basically. So, and the thing, property is an easy snatch. You know, they might say, well, we'll pass a once-off wealth tax, and, then, and all the, the masses are going to cheer for that, you know. But bring all the crabs in the bucket, you know. All the crabs will click their pincers to get fat crab back in the bucket. Um, so you will potentially have these rather funny notions, once-off wealth taxes and uh, a property uh, annual levy for those that are fortunate to have homes, and they're going to make taxation very, very high. That's how you make it cheap for the likes of the, the hedge fund ruling class, megacorp, black rocks mm -hmm. to acquire. And they'll then have a separate license that will be quasi-governmental and they'll be a home lord or slum lord of choice. Uh, and then we'll all be renting back our stuff from them. And I fear that. You know, I fear that. That is an asset well, there, stripping. A, it's a realistic scenario. It's yeah. one of the many scenarios that, that could potentially happen, quite yeah. honestly. So um, re the way you prevent that is pay off your mortgages and don't, uh, probably don't buy more than you need property. I, it's a bit weird because I've actually been accumulating. So I need to sell my 20 Airbnbs I've mortgaged <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. You definitely. <laughs> uh, it's better to have 20 properties in different locales outside of the West, which has been my playbook. So I, I, I've actually gone having a few in the BRICS nations. Because what they're doing is they're sort of night and daying two halves of the planet. We are actually getting sunsetted on the West yeah. and we might be getting sunrise. The old communist states are becoming pragmatic and sounding more sensible politically and the old capitalistic nations are sounding more communist. Yeah. So we're actually getting the sunset and it also follows the traveling of the gold as well, the sensible, where the golden rule is, the you know, he who holds the gold makes the yeah. rules uh, and we're seeing that going across. So the whole, there's a migration. So have alternatives and that's weird because it's kind of like no, having a home in Georgia, in Eastern Europe, or Cape Town in South Africa, or something in Panama, Latin America, Bali, Indonesia, actually makes better sense investable-wise and sustainability-wise than maybe doubling up with the Airbnbs here <laughs> in Miami yeah. uh, might. And it's difficult to envisage because everybody's grooving, the sun comes up, it's still a good place, but the governments will become radicalized. Yeah, and they'll also be essential force. services at some point. Yeah. Like infrastructure investments, the potholes yeah. aren't going to get fixed, and you'll 100 see it You can see a mass decay in living standards. Maintenance yeah. doesn't get done. And it's helped. I kind of lived through this with the South African experience. You know, we had a government that was probably not qualified, didn't expend on maintenance, and then you saw grid down. You know, well, just seeing that in Texas. Yeah, no, yeah. Just after the, yeah. you know, they, they just had a hurricane, so that you yeah. know some of the infrastructure has been destroyed. But it's, it's a not coming back. Infrastructure problem. Yeah, it's like, not coming why are back. Power lines in the U.S. above ground and underground. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. as a European, you know, just like yeah. scratching my head over that one. Yeah. Especially in an area where there's constant hurricanes okay. coming through. Yeah. <laughs> um, gold. I don't know. I missed my segue to gold, but uh, you touched on it. But uh, how much of a pivot is already priced in the gold price right now? And uh, is Not there anything much. priced in? Yeah. You just have to look at the percentages to say, and look at the number of seats. I mean, the capacity we could have had, it's been well attended, yeah. but it's, it's not full. Yeah. 
The, um, oh, we're far from euphoric here at all. Exactly. Like, and I think it was, uh, I th- might have been chatting to Rick Rule himself. He says, you know, when you've got girls wanting uh, the likes of Rick Rule, uh, he didn't mention himself, but uh, the, the resource guys to sign their shirts on the back and you've got cues coming into uh, resource uh, events like this then you know you're you're getting to the top oh my god we're so uh, far we're, away we're from so that. far away from that and if you look at the average holdings and exposure to metals and even when i was talking to keith newmeyer earlier um he's just saying that the, there's no money the funds and the institutions are not into miners you know newmont popped no, it's like, it's like the only one left yeah. the sector yeah like yeah. funds have been you know completely um, obliterated i wouldn't say obliterated but dissolved they yeah. just disappeared. They left the sector. Sixteen yeah. billion dollars, I think, is the number in terms yeah. of like fund money that just left. That used to be yeah. big investors here in yeah. this space. And 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 during the eighties and the seventies, with the you know the Vietnam War and the bombing and the the, the lack of the tie to the dollar, and the, the, when we went off sound money completely, the final severing, um, you know, people had five percent of gold in their portfolios, and people had gold stocks in the ideal portfolio. It just doesn't happen anymore. It's been the financial engineering cycle that went with the 40-year bond cycle, saw everything fiat groovy. Don't worry about it. Just put it on my tab. And that cycle has ended. And that killed gold. You know, the 250 buy mark in 2000, that was peak .com. The heat map was all .com. Gold got absolutely uh, slaughtered. Why are you holding this relic? It pays no income. It costs you to put it somewhere. That was the story. Warren Buffett has repeated similar things. You know, pet rocked him and all of this. And you, you have it in the ground. You pay to get it out of the ground, only to put it back in the ground. And all of these funny meme comments. Yeah. Um, and actually, in an, in, in an inflation, stagflationary environment, this is when it comes into play. Because it will hold value. That's its job. But and and the dollar is in a, a super loss uh, of value. And all fiats are. Um, in fact, some more so, as we've mentioned the yen. Um, and that's that's the trade. That's why I, I wanted to bring in gold. Even with that, we can play cross fiats, but they're all lepers <laughs> in the leper colony. Yes, there's an uglier leper that's closer to death than than one that's just recently joined the colony. Um, but the ideal trade is you want to get that. Uh, um, you want to get that Japanese yeah, yen f- uh, trade. Picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. Exactly, exactly. Right. You get the yen uh, financing, yeah. the, the, what's it, the carry trade, and put it in uh, metals. And we called the biggest setup technically on gold yen some time ago. Uh, and that has been the mover, actually. If you're talking money and fiat and currencies, you want to hold money versus the worst fiat. Because yeah. that's the, you know, c- currencies are pairs trade money against the worst fiat and that was gold yen Uh, and it will soon become (laughs) silver yen maybe uh, when the silver starts outperforming fantastic Francis we got to wrap a bow around this you know like where can we find more of your work yeah thanks for having us on we're on the market sniper.com our core focus is helping people navigate this huge flood that is coming the transition gold is the arch and the magic stair over that there's more to it than just that though there's quite a bit of preparation you need to do uh, but the market sniper.com follow the youtube if you like what we say you can always book a call thanks for Fantastic. having me on oh absolutely francis really appreciate it it's a pleasure to meet you in person really yeah, appreciate indeed. it and me uh, too. we'll link to all the channels and everything down below as well and to everybody else thank you so much for tuning in a tremendous enjoyed the conversation here with Francis always different energy when we do stuff in person it make, makes a big difference I, I think at least and uh, I really enjoy it thank you so much for tuning in make sure to subscribe hit that like button leave a comment how are you positioned and uh, how, how are you how are you playing this like how are you positioning like are, do you own money market funds do you, you know, are you happy with 5% yield and uh, how risk free is it in your opinion really want to hear from you thank you so much for tuning in we'll be, lo- we'll be back with lots more from the Rules Symposium here in Boca Raton thank you so much and take care <laughs>